Good evening folks, it's Wednesday night and we're going to come again and do our Bible study and we're going to be in uh, Hebrews chapter 9 again beginning at verse 11. But before we start, let us pause and let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you again for the day that has passed. Thank you for your presence with us, um, for your provision, for your grace, for your blessing. Lord, you are a great God who is so good to us. And we are truly thankful. As we come to your word now, again, Father, we just ask for you to still and settle our hearts, to open up our hearts and minds to you, to open us up to the leading of direction of your spirit, so that we can understand your word and see what it says to each of us, so that we can grow closer to you through it, come to a better understanding of our relationship with you um, each and every day. So, Father, be with us now, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. So, let's read together some of uh, chapter 9. There's no way that we're going to get through all of chapter 9 tonight, but we'll see how far we get. So, I'm going to start and read at verse 11. And I'll read through to the end of verse 15, just to begin with. Uh, and then we'll take it from there. So Christ now has become the high priest over all the good things that have come. He has entered that greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven, which was not made by human hands. It is not part of this created world. With his own blood, not with the blood of goats or calves, he entered the most high place. Once for all time and secured our redemption forever. Under the old system, the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of young cows would cleanse people's bodies from ceremonial impurities. Just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our conscience from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. For by, by, the, by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. That is why he is the one who mediates the new covenant between God and people so that all who are called can receive the internal inheritance God has promised them. For Christ died to set them free from the penalty of sins the day had committed under the first covenant. It's a bit of a recap nearly on what we've already seen, a bit of repetition from the author of Hebrews. Again, just talking about how Jesus is our high priest. Interesting how he says about Jesus is in a greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven. Uh, so it is again a reflection that uh, the tabernacle on earth and the temple were to reflect what heaven would be like and to reflect what was there. Uh, so it just helps us to see that. And as well that Jesus goes in with his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves. So it's Christ's sacrifice, even his own sacrifice that takes him in. And it's the fact that it says he entered the most holy place once for all time and secured our redemption forever. Again, the priest had to go in, high priest had to go in once a year to the Holy of Holies to offer a sacrifice for the unforgiven sins or the un unknown sins of the nation so that the nation would be put right with God. Now, the author is saying that doesn't have to happen any longer. Christ's sacrifice was a once for all sins. Uh, he doesn't have to be conti continually sacrificed. His death is the perfect death that covers us for everything. Uh, I'd said last week um, about maybe people, maybe this was written to people who were not Jews um, and they didn't understand what the tabernacle was and how it worked. Um, quite rightly so, someone asked a question on that. Um, and it is possible that there are Jews listening to this as well, but maybe they're Jewish by name, but not by practice. So they would call themselves people belonging to the Jewish religion but um, they don't really know the laws of the temple. And that's why at the start of chapter nine, there's like a, re a, a recap on the laws, uh, but he doesn't go into it in too much detail. But it's good always to remind ourselves of what happens and how it happens, the reason behind it. Maybe again, yeah, that's the reason why he does it. But it's all about the sacrifices which are offered. It's interesting, he says that under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls, and the ashes of young cows could cleanse people's body from ceremonial impurity. Excuse me. It's not that it's forgiving sin. It's that idea of ceremonial impurity. 
to purify so that they can go in to worship. Um, it's nearly a recognition of the fact that the blood and the, and the ashes couldn't actually forgive people of their sins. Um, it was, again, a reflection of what was to come. And if you look at it that way, you know, then you start to realise that everything is pointing towards Christ. The sacrifices that were made and the blood that was spilt was to represent what Jesus would go through for us. And everything is pointing towards Christ. Uh, and about that new covenant, that promise, um, which is about our relationship between God and ourselves. That, that word covenant can also be interpreted um, as the word will. And a lot of Bibles interpret the following verses using the word will, and, and it does seem confusing. So let me read a few of those verses, and then we'll try and explain them together. Verse 16. Now, when someone leaves a will, it is necessary to prove that the person who made it is dead. The will goes into effect only after the person's death. While the person who made it is still alive, the will cannot be put into effect. That was why even the first covenant was put into effect with the blood of an animal. Then ending at verse 18. That word will can be translated as covenant. Um, and that phrase, now someone who makes a will, can also be, can be translated when, when someone makes a covenant. And, and we go on in that verse. So when a person who makes a covenant, um, it must be ratified with blood is another way of putting it and when you start to look at it that way then the following verses make sense because those verses as they sit don't seem to make any sense now when someone leaves a will it is necessary to prove that the person who made it is dead the will goes into effect only after the person's death while the person who made it is still alive it will cannot be put into effect that is why even the first covenant was put into effect with the blood of an animal they seem disconnected Whenever you read it like that, and even if you go to the NIV and read it in that, if you go to other translations as well, it's, there seems to be that disconnect. But when you look at the words in the translations and how you can translate that phrase, and when you ever, you actually translate the word as covenants, and it's necessary to ratify a covenant with blood, then the following verses start to make sense. Following verses say this. For after Moses had read each of God's commandments to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats along with water and sprinkled both the book of God's law and all the people using hyssop branches and scarlet wool. Then he said, this blood confirms the covenant that God made with you. In the same way, he sprinkled blood on the tabernacle and on everything used for worship. In fact, according to the law of Moses, nearly everything was purified with blood. For without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. That is why the tabernacle and everything in it, which were copies of things in heaven, had to be purified by the blood of animals. But the real thing in heaven had to be purified with far better sacrifices than the blood of animals. When you start to hear it that way, and read those preceding verses about rather than will as covenant and ratified with blood, then hopefully they start to make sense. So God gave Moses the description and the, and the measurements and everything that was needed to make the tabernacle, to make the place where God would be worshipped, to make the place where part of God's presence would dwell in that cloud that would come down, uh, and to make it clean and suitable and, and to confirm the promises that God was making then blood had to be sacrificed and sprinkled on everything to make it pure because God can't have sin. So the tabernacle was sprinkled with blood, the book of the law was sprinkled with blood, all the ins, everything that was used in the tabernacle was sprinkled and even the very people were sprinkled with blood to cleanse them or to have their sins covered as such. Again, reflect back to the children of Israel escaping from Egypt and they had to sacrifice an animal. They had to put the blood on the, the top of the door, the lintel and the doorposts so that the angel of death would pass over them 
and those houses where that didn't happen, then the firstborn died. That covering of blood is what's happening for the promise that God makes with his people or the covenant that God makes with them, that he will be their God and they will be his people. And he, that as long as they follow him uh, and, and look at, you know, seek to follow his will, that he will always look after them. And then we talk about the new covenant, which is Jesus dying for our sins, for all people. And how that is for all the people of the earth, and how it is, you know, talking about Jesus entering the tabernacle, the Holy of Holies in heaven. And how then it had to be his blood was the only thing that could take Jesus in there so that God would give us grace or forgiveness of sins. So again, it's like all those sacrifices in the Old Testament and right the way up until Jesus' death um, are reflecting what Jesus would go through. And the true sacrifice of Jesus covers all those sins and forgiveness of all of that and the forgiveness for us for the future. So that is why the tabernacle and everything in it, which were copies of things in heaven, had to be purified by the blood of animals. But the real thing in heaven had to be purified with a far better sacrifice than the blood of animals. For Christ did not enter into the holy place made with human hands, which was only a copy of the, tr the true temple, of the true heaven. He entered into heaven itself to appear now before God on our behalf. And he did not enter to offer himself again and again, like the high priest here on earth who enters the most high holy place year after year with the blood of animals. If that had been necessary, Christ would have had to die again and again ever since the world began. But now... Once for all time, he has appeared at the end of the age to remove sin by his own death as a sacrifice. Jesus doesn't have to die over and over again. Jesus was so pure. Jesus was the perfect um, person that he only had to die once forever to forgive our sins. And now he sits at the right hand of God, interceding for us. And our sins are forgiven. It's amazing and incredible what he has done for us. But the author, he goes into so much detail. Because he needs us to understand that. You know, some people believe that you can be saved. And then lost again. I, I don't believe that. I believe once we have God's forgiveness. We always have God's forgiveness. We can stray from God. We can break our communication with God. But that bond of salvation stays. Because if that bond of salvation is lost again. It's like saying that the sacrifice of Jesus is not enough. And whenever we come and we have to ask for forgiveness again. It, it is like crucifying Christ all over again. But God's word said he only had to die once for our sins. God knows we're not perfect. God knows that even after forgiveness, we will keep on doing things wrong. Jesus hinted to that. He, that's what he talked about when he washed his disciples' feet in um, John 13. You know, when Peter says, don't just wash my feet, Lord, but wash all of me. And Jesus says, but when you've had a bath, I don't need to wash all of you. I just need to wash your feet and it's that sense that Christ has cleansed us and whenever we come back we just we're recognizing the sins that we have committed and we're just asking Jesus to wash our feet to refresh us we're not having to have a bath again be forgiven again as such because Christ's sacrifice is for all time think about that what Jesus has done for you if you accept him, makes you completely right with God. Yes, the Bible tells us that one day we will have to give an account of ourselves. What that is, we don't know. I've said it before. Right? But we're made right with God. And the author keeps on pressing that point home. The temple and the sacrifices are not good enough. Maybe 
some of the people who you're writing to are Israelites or Jewish and they still want to keep going to the temple and offering sacrifices. And maybe there's tension going on within the Christian community about whether do we sacrifice it or not. And maybe the author is trying to address that issue and saying, look, sacrifices are gone. They no longer have a place because Jesus has died for us. So we don't need to keep on killing animals and sprinkling their blood because Christ has done that for us. And we simply have to realise that the earthly temple is a reflection of heaven. And once we realise that and realise what Christ has done for us, then the earthly part fades away and doesn't matter. What matters is that special relationship with God, the special relationship through Jesus and what he's done for us. If we can grasp that, then we fully grasp salvation. And if we can grasp that, then we can tell others and show others through word and through deed what it means. Yeah, we'll still struggle. Yes, we'll still get things wrong. But we're forgiven. We have that forgiveness. I don't know about you, but whenever you have a really bad day and whenever you know you have failed God and you, you know, you, you feel that you failed everybody else around you and then you realise that God doesn't see you that way but that God sees you as one of his children covered by the blood of his son then that should heal your heart Realise that you have God's forgiveness. It doesn't give us carte blanche to go out and keep on doing what we were doing. It should make us want to change. But you do have God's forgiveness. That you are not a failure. But rather, you are God's child. Do you see yourself as God's child? Are you God's child, first of all? If you are, do you see yourself as God's child? And if you can see yourself as God's child, if you do, does that not change how you feel right now? Does that not change how you feel your relationship with God is? And if you don't have that, it's not too late. Let Christ's blood wash over you and forgive you of your sin. Let's pray together. Father, your word is at times so complex but then, Lord, the message is so simple. Help us, Father, to understand, to let it sink into each of our own hearts and to let it change how we are, how we think, how we act. Lord, thank you. In Christ's name. Amen. Thanks, folks. We're going to leave it there for Christmas and New Year. Um, next Wednesday night is our carol service down in church, um, so not be streaming. And the following, um, so the next Wednesday and the following Wednesday will be off as well. So we'll be back again the first Wednesday in January. But until then, take care and God bless. Please stay safe over Christmas. And I pray that you have a blessed Christmas time. Take care, folks. Bye.